Okay, we're in Nehemiah chapter 1, and I'm going to read just verses 5 uh, through 7, uh, just uh, for the sake of reading, and then we'll consider this portion together. It begins in verse 5 this way, Nehemiah 1 verse 5, it says, And I, I and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments, let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Again, God will bless that reading again from his precious word. So we're looking at Nehemiah's response to the news that he heard when he got this report on the state of things concerning the Jews and Jerusalem, concerning the people of God and the place where God had chosen to place his name. And the result is that, as we heard, he was mourning and fasting and all of these things, certain days. And now, verse 5, we, we transition into the prayer that he begins to pray uh, as a result. It gives us a little window, I suppose, into how he was praying. And so this is what he said. I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible. So we want to notice uh, as we begin, first of all, maybe we should just acknowledge this, that Nehemiah is primarily a man of prayer. Uh, it, it's good to, to be aware of that. It's kind of interesting. Some of the greatest men of God have been primarily men of prayer. Uh, I just recently read the bi biography of C.H. Spurgeon, wonderful biography, thoroughly enjoyed it. But one of the things that comes out of that book is that he was a praying man and he preached to a praying people. People often wonder what was the reason for his success. And he would say prayer. God answers prayer. A praying man with a praying not to think of, oh, he's a great preacher. He was a great preacher, but that great preaching was so helped and aided by the fact that he was a praying man and he had a praying people that he preached to. So we want to just acknowledge that, that we need to be men of prayer. And I just want to run through the book quickly just to see how many times we've got prayer. We've got this prayer here in chapter 1. We're going to analyze it. But look at chapter 2, verse 4. It says, Then the king said to me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. Chapter 4 and verse 4. Hear, O our God, for we are despised, and turn their reproach upon their own head. Give them for a prey in the land of captivity. So again, here he is praying. Chapter 5, verse 19. Again we notice, he says, Think upon me, my God, for good, according to all that I have done for this people. Chapter 6, verse 9. But they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work that is that, that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. That's 6, verse 9. 6, verse 14. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sambalat, according to these their works, and on the prophetess Noadiah, and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. And then we'll notice in, later on now, we're getting to chapter 13, Nehemiah 13, just a few references here, verse 14, 13, verse 14, Remember me, O God, O my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. 1422, And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day, remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. Verse 29, remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. And finally, verse 31, for the wood offering at times appointed and for the first fruits, remember me, O my God, for good. So do you see a bit of a pattern here? I would say that Nehemiah was a man 
who was in consistent, constant communion with God. He's a man of prayer. That's why God used him so greatly. If we would want to be used of God, we must be men and women of prayer. And it's good to ask ourselves, how's our prayer life? How are we doing in that area? Is that our strong point? How would you grade yourself? A++? You can answer that question yourself. I would suggest to you that, generally speaking, our weakest area is our prayer life. And yet we look at Nehemiah and say, oh, wouldn't it be nice to be a Nehemiah? Well, he's willing to pay the price to be a Nehemiah. You have to become a person of prayer. So he's a man of prayer. And so notice it, it says, um, as he prays, we beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and terrible God. Now, I just wanted to notice some of the things that he mentions here. Really, he starts his prayer by reminding himself of who it is that he's addressing. I think it's always good to, you know, I used to always think this was strange. I'd hear brethren, especially when we were in Ireland, we'd hear these brethren from Northern Ireland, they stand up and pray, and as they're praying, they're, 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 they're talking, telling God all the things about him. You know, he's this and he's this and this. And I remember as a, a relatively young believer thinking, why are they telling God who he is? Doesn't he know who he is? Like he does know who he is, doesn't he? They weren't doing it for God's benefit. He knows exactly who he is. They're doing it for their benefit. See, once I recognize who he is, the greatness of his person, the problem, however huge it seems, is brought down to size. Because in the light of his greatness, it's not such a big problem after all. Because after all, he's God, right? Like Jeremiah, our Lord God, you made the heavens and the earth by thy great power and outstretched arm, and there's nothing too difficult for thee. Also, this problem doesn't look so big in the light of God's greatness. And so it's always good in prayer to begin by reminding ourselves of the one whom we're addressing and his greatness. And so that's what he does. And so he begins with this idea, God of heaven. Uh, not just the God of of Israel, but he's the God of heaven. Actually, God of heaven is kind of unique to the captivity books. Because in a sense, it's now the times of the Gentiles. And so he's no longer just the God of Israel. Uh, he's working on a bigger scheme now. He's working on a bigger, he's working amongst the nations. He's the God of heaven. God of heaven, great, a great God and terrible God. Terrible in the sense of uh, one that uh, can indeed, if you come into his presence unprepared, can cause terror, right? He, he, he causes awe, causes wonder. He's the great and terrible God, and he keeps covenant. He's a covenant-keeping God. He's a God that when he makes promises, he keeps them. It's good to know that, isn't it? A promise-keeping God. And not only does he keep promises, he's also a God of mercy for them that love him shows his mercy, his tender mercies of God. So it's just, he does this just to remind himself of the greatness of God, faithfulness of God, uh, the mercy of God, all of these things. And it's good for us when we pray, especially in our age, we're concerned about the state of the church, we're concerned about the way things are, and it's good to remind the Lord not only who he is, but his covenants, his promises. So how about this promise? I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Is that a promise? It's a certain promise, isn't it? It's good to remind of that. Who will have all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth? Is that, is that, is that true? Is that what God says? Remind them of these things. It's really good to... Re I think our prayers should be fueled by Scripture. I find the best prayer times that I have is usually after reading the Scriptures, seeing something in there, and then praying it back to God. I find that so helpful in prayer. Lord, you said this. I didn't say this. You said it. I said something the other day. Uh, uh, we have gone out into the work, and all of a sudden, all of our supporters either stop supporting us or die. And so suddenly, we have no support coming in. And my wife is petrified, she's convinced we're the first missionaries who will ever starve to death. Now just look at me, does that look like that happened? Not at all. We didn't went without a meal, it was, we, we, we chose to go without a meal. The Lord has been faithful. I remember saying to my wife, I said, the Great Commission, 
is not my idea, it's his. If he wants us involved, he'll foot the bill. If he doesn't, I'll get a job. Somehow, those words calmed her spirit. <laughs> but it's what's the basis of it? It's God. It's his idea. He'll supply. And, and so we look to him and he's so faithful. And so basically, it's good to remind ourselves in whom we are speaking. And then notice verse 6. He says, Let thy ear now be attentive, thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night. So again, we're talking about, he's a man, not only a man of prayer, but constant prayer, day and night. Like this is not, we're just getting a kind of summary of his prayer here, but he's praying day and night. It's a wonderful thing if you wake up in the night. You can't go back to sleep. And make a suggestion. Don't count sheep. Yeah. Pray for sheep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, think of the sheep in your Pray for them. And you probably fall back asleep again. But pray. You, my wife and I often say, the nights we can't sleep, is the Lord trying to say something to us, or does he want us to pray for somebody? And we try to do that. And, and so, again, just that simple thought. Day and night, there's a constancy in his prayer life. It's... It, it, it's it's very consistent, continuity in prayer. And it says, For the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel. Now, if it just stopped there, you would think that he has nothing to do with the problem. Lord, these assembly people, they really need to be straightened out. Lord, when you work in those people in my assembly, I mean, oh, some of those folks in my assembly, they're real rascals. You, Lord, when you work in their lives, if he stopped there, that's what you think he was saying. Notice he says, which we have sinned against thee. Who's he including in that equation? He's saying, Lord, I'm part of the problem. All the great men of Scripture that prayed, with the exception of the Lord Jesus, he never was part of the problem. He always was the solution and the answer. But everybody else had prayed. Moses, Ezra, Daniel. Read Daniel chapter 9. Magnificent prayer, Daniel chapter 9. And Daniel again and again. Even though nobody could find any fault with him apart from his God. And yet, as he prays, he confesses his sins and the sins of his people. And so, we have to acknowledge that, in a sense, we're part of the problem. I've often said, one of the greatest statements I ever heard that really helped me in understanding how I fit into the local assembly was this little ditty that I heard somebody say, and it goes like this, if everyone in the assembly was like me, what kind of an assembly would there be? Now, I, I think we should stick that on the mirrors in our bathrooms. If everyone in the assembly was like me, what kind of an assembly would there be? Now, I can't answer that question for you. I can just do it for myself. But if it was just made up of people like me, would it be a healthy assembly or would it be a pretty weak assembly? It's good to ask that, isn't it? Like, what am I contributing? Am I part of the problem here? You see, it's easy to see everybody else as part of the problem, isn't it? If the elders would just get their act together, or if those, you know, those young people, if they just straighten out, it's so easy to put the blame somewhere else. But what about me? Start here, and that's what he does. We have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. He recognizes that the state of the city of God and the people of God, part of it is because of him and his father's house. We have sinned. And who of us hasn't? How many of us have failed in terms of assembly work? I think every one of us, if we're really honest. And so he says in verse 7, he says, We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. And so what he's saying is, that the heart of the matter is not the Persian captives. 
They were in this condition because of their failure to be obedient to the word of God. They had entered into a covenant agreement with God. They failed in it. And so in verse 8, it says, Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If you transgress, I'll scatter you abroad among the, the, the nations. That's Deuteronomy 28, Deuteronomy 30, uh, Leviticus 26. Lots of places where it tells them that if they rebelled against God, they kept, didn't keep his commandments, he would cast them out of the nations, among the nations. But he says in verse 9, But if you turn to me, and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of you cast out into the uttermost parts of heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them into the place that I have chosen to set my name there. And so, what is he doing? He's reminding, again, we already said this, he's reminding the Lord of his own word. Right? He's, he's quoting scripture to God, telling him about what he said, reminding him of his promises, reminding him of his covenant agreements. And again, we would say this, in our prayer, it's good to remind the Lord of His promises. Uh, I have a, a, a list of prayer, of scriptures. Uh, we often pray, a group of us, for prodigals. And I have a list of scriptures that were actually written to Israel. But I say, Lord, you're not going to mind if I use this for the people of God today. And it's all about prodigals. And I pray for that. I remind the Lord of His word. And it's good to do that. I think, I think it's a wonderful. God likes to be reminded of His Word. He loves His Word more than we do. Remind Him of what He said in prayer. And so this is what He does. And He now prays very specifically. He says in verse 10, Now these are thy servants and thy people, in verse 10, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. He says, Lord, Despite all their failures, and all their failures are many, our failures are many, he says they're still your people. You still redeem them by your blood. It's good to be reminded that God's people, for all their failures, are still his people. And he values them greatly. So much so that he shed his own precious blood for them. That's how much he values these people. And so it's a great reminder. And then he says, verse 11, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name and prosper. Now here's an encouraging word in verse 11, because he's, he's now telling us that he's pretty convinced that he's not the only one praying. He says, be attentive to the prayer of thy servant. And then he says, and to the prayer of thy servant. You notice that? So he's not like Elijah saying, Lord, I'm the only one. <laughs> and, you know, there's nobody else faithful. He recognizes even in the bleak day there is, there are others that are also seeking the face of God as well. And it's good to be reminded, isn't it? There are people out there. We may not even know who they are, but they're, they're praying like we are. They, they want a revived work amongst God's people. And they're seeking His face. And so He says, Let your ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servants and to the prayer of thy, thy servant of thy servants. And, and, and they desire to fear thy name. That's their motivation. Uh, he's not alone in prayer, but there are others. They want to fear the name of God. And they want to prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cup bearer. And so his concern, his desire to fear your name. It's an amazing theme, isn't it? The name of God. We desire to fear thy name. In other words, that name is so precious to us, we don't want to, we've already, in a sense, dishonored your name. But we don't want to do that anymore. We want to reverently treat your name. We don't want to drag your name into the mud anymore, Lord. We want to honor your name, magnify your name, glorify your name. It's good, again, even in our own prayer life, to remind us, of why are we doing all this? What's the point of it all? 
It's for the glory of his name. We want him to be magnified. Let those that love thy salvation say continually, The Lord be magnified. We want his name to be glorified, his honor. And so he, he prays for this. And then he makes a startling statement. He says, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. You know who this man was? He's the king of the largest empire in the world right now. Like, he's, we would say, he's a pretty big player on the world stage. The king of the largest empire on the earth at, right, at that moment in time. And yet, in Daniel's, uh, or in Nehemiah's eyes, you know who he is? He's just a man. He's this man. Just a man. I mean, these men almost demanded worship. I mean, you're going to see later on, you know, Nehemiah was sat in his presence. It, you know, it was a dangerous business to be sat in the king's presence because they had such phenomenal egos, they thought you should be happy to be in their presence. And yet, he said, he's just a man. This man, yeah, he's this man, but he's just a man. Grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cup bearer. So as we conclude this first chapter, but now we're not done, we've got, we're going to move into chapter 2, which is our goal, but we want to just uh, recognize that part of his difficulty was this man. He wants to go and be a part of the solution. He sees the state of things as they really are. He, he wants to be part of the solution, but you know, in order to be part of the solution, he's going to need a big leave of absence from this man. He's going to need help from this man if he's going to accomplish anything. And so, in a sense, what's in the way of what his heart wants to do right now is this man. And so he says, grant him mercy in the sight of this man. And then he says, for I was the king's cup there. I'm the most trusted man in the whole of the empire by the king. And I'm going to ask him to let me go to a, a, a city that's in ruins to help build the wall. And what do you think the prospects, humanly speaking, of getting a long leave of absence when you're the most trusted man in the whole empire? Can you see the sense of the problem? This is not easy to get permission for this. And that's why he's asking the Lord to grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cook there. So we might say this, and just in, in writing some concluding thoughts from our first section is this. Do we see it as it really is? Do we see failure amongst the people of God so that the testimony is a, a little bit of reproach right now amongst many testimonies of God's people. Unless we see that, we'll never really be moved to weep and mourn and fast or even want to be part of the solution. If we don't see there's a problem, we'll never want to be part of the solution. Are we willing to admit that we are part of the problem? That it's not somebody else's fault. That I'm part of the problem in my local assembly. And assemblies never rise above the, the caliber of the individuals that make them up, right? In other words, if I want a better assembly, I better be a better me. That's where it begins. Be the man God would have me to be. I can't change anybody else, but what I can do is I can change me. Or I can let God change me. That's probably a better way of putting it. And, and so, admit we're part of the problem. That the root of the problem is disobedience to the Word of God. Always is. Remind the Lord of His promises and His character. And determine to get involved and be part of the solution. It's so much easier to be an armchair critic than to be actually in the game. <coughs> Do you know what I mean? I got, I, I, I'll confess to you, I watch 10 minutes of soccer highlights a week. 
limit myself because that could take over my life. So I limit myself to 10 minutes of soccer highlights per week. And it's very easy for me, especially if my team moves, to criticize those guys. It's easy to do it. It's a lot harder to be on the game. And I used to play, so I know it's hard to be on the game. And so it's for us, we're going to be armchair critics, and we're going to get in the game. Look at chapter 2 now, please. And again, we'll do the same as last time. We'll give a little outline to the chapter, and then we'll work through it. And so we want to think in this chapter about his preparation for the work. Because he, he's seen the problem, and he wants to be part of the solution, and he hasn't got an answer from the king yet. He's still, this man is still the, in the way, in a sense, of him being able to go and do what he wants to do. But even though he hasn't got an answer yet, he's so convinced the Lord wants him involved in the work, he's already going to make his plans. Okay? So we're going to see uh, his preparation for the work. So verses 1 through 8, the opportunity he took. We're going to see that he takes a definite opportunity, verse 1 through 8. And then in verse 9 through 16, we're going to see the obstacles that he saw. And 17 and 18, the optimism he showed. And verse 19 and 20, the opposition he met. So... If you're going too fast, I can just say that again quickly. Chapter 2, the opportunity he took, verses 1 through 8. 9 through 16, the obstacles he saw. 17 and 18, the optimism he showed. 19 and 20, the opportunity or the opposition he met. And that will take us nicely to the end of chapter 2. So, beginning in the start of chapter 2 and his preparation for the work, the opportunity that he took. It came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it up to the king. Now I have not been before time sad in his presence. So one thing that we notice is saying, you know, began back in November, December, the month of Chislu. Uh, now we're in March, April, so several months have elapsed. And all that time, he's carried a burden in secret. He, he's never allowed himself to be sad in the presence of the king. Now that's that's not it's not easy. For some of us, it's it's more difficult than others. Some of us we wear our hearts on our sleeve, right? There's a dear brother in our assembly, and uh, the Wednesday before week before last on a Wednesday, I was at the meeting, and uh, I could just tell just by looking at him something wasn't right. I said, brother, what's going on? <laughs> And he's got a teenage son, and they've been having some discipline challenges. But he wears it. You know, just by looking, that all is not well with our dear brother. Now, if everything's well, the guy's glowing like a light bulb. I mean, you could just tell everything's going well, but I could just by looking at it. Some of us wear our hearts on our sleeves. It's much more difficult for us to fake it. But this man somehow manages for four months to keep inside this burden, and he smiles in the presence of the king. But there's a day that comes when the burden is so great, he can't hide it anymore. It comes out. And so he carries this burden in secret, and of course, we believe that during this time he kept on praying, kept on weeping, weeping and uh, finally the king observes this. And so it says in verse 2, Wherefore the king said to me, Why is thy countenance sad? Seeing thou art not sick, this is nothing else but sorrow of heart, then I was very sore afraid. By the way, isn't that amazing that the king noticed? Sometimes there could be broken hearted people in our assembly, and we don't even notice it. 
Maybe that it's obvious written over their faces, but we, we're just too busy with our own agenda. We don't even notice it. Here's the king of this massive empire, and he notices his servant, the cupbearer, and he says, there's something going on with you. I know you're not sick, but I can tell you're sad. What's going on? That's kind of a big thing, isn't it, for a king to even be concerned. And, and again, we should be concerned about the state of our fellow believers. How are they doing? You know how we are. We're so good at this, aren't we? How are you doing, brother? Fine. You could be dying on the inside, but you're not going to tell anybody. You're just fine. We're, we're good at hiding it, aren't we? And, and it's sometimes good to be honest. Well, I'm really struggling. Will you pray for me? We could minister to, to each other so much easier if we were just honest. I, I'm really struggling with this. I need you to pray for me. That would be good, wouldn't it? But anyway, the king can see it. It's sorrow of heart. And he said, I was very sore afraid. He's petrified. Because you weren't supposed to be sad in the king's presence. These guys have got egos, generally speaking, almost a God complex. They, they feel that they're, they're, everybody should be happy to be around them. And, and so suddenly, in, in the presence of this heathen king, he, he's witnessed the sadness in Nehemiah, and he says, I was very so afraid. And I said to the king, let the king live forever, why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? And so um, he tells the king what's going on in his heart. And he addresses him with great courtesy. But the king lived forever. It's amazing how respectful Daniel, Nehemiah, Ezra, all of these men are incredibly respectful to their authorities. How they address them, how they speak to them. I, I think perhaps one of the biggest sins amongst Christians, at least south of the border, maybe up here too, is disrespect to people in authority. Especially if we don't particularly like the policies of the kings or presidents or prime ministers or whatever. And amongst the lost people, see our culture, you know, how divided it is and how terrible things are said about them. And we can get caught up in all that. But you don't see that in scripture. And in the New Testament too. First Peter, he says, honor the king. Who was the king, by the way? That was Nero. You, really, you want to know what a wicked man was like? Read the life story of Nero. Defile it, to even read it. Very, very wicked man. And yet they respected the man's office, even if they couldn't respect the man. And they spoke well in terms of addressing them. And so, Lord, help me. I don't want to sin. And I, I found myself doing this. I used to listen to Christian talk radio when I drive around in the car. And all this political talk and all this stuff. And I get so mad that I'd be ready to spit nails. I was absolutely... In, and I just thought, it's not worth it. My sanctification is more important than listening to this. So I started listening to ministry and Christian hymns and... I don't get mad anymore. But when I listen to that stuff, it gets me all fired up. I want to be fired up, but for the Lord. Not for this kind of stuff. And, and so, again, how do we address people in authority? Do we, do we give them their proper titles? Do we respect them? And so then he said, uh, O King, live forever. And, and he tells him what's on his heart. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, I didn't tell him which city, he just, the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lies waste, the gates thereof are consumed with fire. And the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? 
And notice what he does. He says, so I prayed to the God of heaven. I prayed to the God of heaven. Before he gives his, his answer of what he would like from the king, before he speaks to the king, he speaks to the king of kings, if you like. And, and it's good, isn't it? A good principle, before we speak to men, we should speak to God long before we ever speak to men. And I think that's good in, in every sense, so whether we're responsible is preaching, we should speak to God before we speak to men. Whether it's personal witnessing, speak to God before you speak to the Lord, give me the words to say, give me wisdom, how to answer this person, give me winsomeness. So how to turn this conversation into a spiritual conversation. We need to speak to God before we ever speak to men. And so he says, I pray to the God of heaven. Now, I'm sure it wasn't a long prayer. The king, <laughs> he couldn't wait for a long prayer because he's the king. He wants an answer. It was a quick prayer. But it was a quick prayer based on a lifetime of prayer. So because he's regularly praying, he can do the quick praying as well. And so he prays to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me into Judah unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And so he asks for permission to be given a leave of absence to rebuild the city walls and build the gates. And, and, and what a... What a big prayer request. Again, we said he's such a trusted man. This is a, this is a big deal. He wants the king to grant him not only permission, we're going to see later on, he's going to, he wants letters of commendation from the king to say he's on the king's business. He wants access to the king's forest. I mean, he, he's going to ask a lot of things because, as one person put it this way, thou art coming to a king, large petitions with thee bring. And so he asks things worthy of a king. Give me leave. Give me permission. Give me uh, a letter. And, and so he brings large requests to the king. And what he's saying is, not only does he need the king's permission, he needs the king's supply. He wants the supply for the king's forest. And again, we would say this, in the work of God, what do we need? Well, we need, we need the assurance that the king is sending us, our king is sending us, and once we have that assurance, we need his supply, the supply of the Spirit, for instance, to do his work, right? We need his divine help, his resources to do his work. And that's what he's asking the king for. I prayed, he says to the God of heaven, said to the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant has found favor in thy sight, send me to Judah, to the city of my father's sepulchers, that I may build it. The king said to me, now notice this, verse 6, the queen also sitting by him. Now it never ever just throws those things in just for no reason. We don't know who the queen is. It's not Esther. Some have tried to say it's Esther, but it isn't. Wish it was. It would be wonderful if it was Esther. Then it would be, you'd understand everything. But let me say this. Maybe the queen also sitting by him is a subtle reminder that Esther had been in the Persian court, hadn't she? And I wonder how much influence she might have had so that the present queen would be favorable to this request. Because all these things fit together very beautifully. So the queen sitting by him he certainly acknowledged that she's there. He wanted to acknowledge her presence, uh, at least in his dialogue. He tells us, the king said to me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be? When wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I sent, set him a time. Moreover, I said to the king, if it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come unto Judah. So he's, he's asking, as it were, for this letter from the king to the governors beyond the river to tell him his mission, why he was there, what his purpose was. And again, I suspect that part of that is that he's already 
learned from what happened to Ezra. All the opposition, all the letter writing that went on, all the difficulty. And you know, if we don't learn from past mistakes, we'll never, we'll, we'll never make any progress. And so he says, I don't want all that hassle. But I know what happened to Ezra. I know what happened there. He's got a good idea of his history. He said, if you just give me a letter, that will really help. And so he gets this letter uh, from the king. He gives it, please the king to send me. And, send, uh, and, he, and he gives him this letter to convey him over. And, and a letter to Asaph, verse 8, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. So what we could say is this, that not only did God answer him, he hand answered him such a way that it was evident that the good hand of God was upon him. Getting letter, getting access to the resources needed in the king's forest, but we're going to see uh, not just that, it says... Um, Look at verse 9. Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. Now he never asked for that. But it would seem that the king gave him exceedingly abundantly above all that he even asked or thought, right? He, 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 he gave him more than he even asked for. He sent military captains with him to escort him there. He didn't ask for that, but he got it. Shouldn't that encourage us in prayer as we come to God in prayer? Do we believe that he's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think? Do we believe that he can supply over and above beyond what we could ever imagine? And, and so again, recognize God, God delights, as it were, to hear and answer the cries of his children. He loves to answer their prayers. He's not, you know, we're not trying to persuade a reluctant God to kind of give us, you know, kind of almost begrudgingly uh, what we ask. He's, he's a giver. The Father of lights who gives every good and perfect gift comes from him, right? He, he's a giving God. He loves to give. And so we come with, with big requests, and these are big requests, and he gets them, and he gets more than he even asks. But notice... Verse 10, we find that there's opposition. It says, when San Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Many years ago, a man who I have the greatest respect for, he's with the Lord now, but this man had a big influence on my life. And he used to always say this, no true work of God will ever go unopposed. Expect it, right? Opposition. And so <clears throat> here, here's this, this move towards bringing change, positive change putting right things that need to be put right, and then there's immediately a kickback. They knew perfectly well what Nehemiah was after. He was concerned only for the welfare of the children of Israel. And the minute that he begins to move, opposition begins to show itself. And we can expect that that's going to happen. Notice that Nehemiah doesn't have any other motive than to seek the welfare of the children of God. He's not there for selfish interests or vain ambitions or desire of personal glory. The only thing that's moving this man is the welfare of the people of God. And even the enemy recognizes that. But they're not happy. He's a marked man. And as soon as he's going to say, let us rise up and build the enemy is going to say, let us rise up and stop him. You can guarantee it. Rise up and build, rise up and stop him. 
In fact, we, we could say something. I want you to go to the book of Acts with me just for a second. A, a really interesting incident in the book of Acts, chapter 19, and verse 13 through 16. It says <laughs> in verse 13, Then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? And the men in whom the evil spirit was late leaped on them, and overcame them, and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now, I just tell that little story, or show that incident, for this simple reason. The demonic world knew exactly who Jesus is, and who Paul is. But the sons of Sceva, who are you? You're not on our radar. We have no idea who you are. Isn't that interesting? I wonder, is your name known to the demonic world? And what I mean by that is this. If, if the church is complacent and apathetic, and we're just going through the motions, we're no threat whatsoever to the enemy's kingdom. He's happy to let us just play church. I mean, he's, he's thrilled. You just go play church, well, you're not a bother to me. The minute you get serious about building for God, the enemy will certainly, you'll come up on his radar screen. And you'll get a big bullseye target on your back. And the enemy will come after you. Because you're a threat to his domain, to his dominion, to his kingdom. And therefore, you'll become known in hell. And that's what's going on here. You know, there was lots of Jews, we've said, in Jerusalem. They'd been there a long time. They had not had much concern for the broken down wall and the ruined testimony. They were perfectly satisfied with the things as they were going. They probably had the mentality, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But the problem is it was broke, and it needed fixing. But in their minds, we've just been looking at this rubble for a long time. It's just rubble. What can we say? Leave it there. Not doing any harm. And so they were just marked by complacency. And now here comes a man whose attitude was a declaration of war against things as they were. He was determined to retrieve ground that the enemy had taken for God. And again, we have to ask the question, does our service for God arouse Satan to worry at all? Are we giving him any anxiety? And are we interested in anything save the welfare of the people? And I, I say the people because we should be concerned about the welfare of God's people, but we also have a bigger concern, a lost and dying world. And we should have a concern for them too. And so we notice that as we consider this opposition, and we notice, by the way, this opposition comes from an interesting source. There's this man, Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant of the Ammonite. As far as we know, the Horonites were um, in, there's a place called Horonaim in Moab. And so, no doubt, a Horonite was from Horonaim, which is in Moab. So you've got somebody from Moab, and you've got somebody from Ammon. 
And then they're joined, when we look at verse 19, but when Sambalat, the Horonite, Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Geshem, the Arabian, heard it, they left us to scorn. So now we've got three main opposition leaders, a Moabite, an Ammonite, and an Arabian. Where are the enemies coming from? It goes back to Abraham, doesn't it? Remember when Abraham was told to go out of Ur the Chaldees? And, and it says, leave thy kindred. Well, what was, was Lot kin at all to Abraham? He sure was, wasn't he? His nephew. But he's supposed to leave his kindred behind in Ur the Chaldees. But he took, Ur, uh, he, he took Lot with him out of Ur the Chaldees. And did Lot cause any problems along the way? Well, he did. And Lot, you, you know the story, he had two children through incestual relationships, Moab and Ammon. And here we are, they've come back to haunt the descendants of Abraham. Opposition. coming. And then what about the Arabians? Where, where did the Arabians come from? The Arabs. Where, where did they, those guys come from? Well, here. Yeah. It's Abraham again, isn't it? Remember Abraham trying to engineer the will of God instead of waiting for the child to promise? He, he, he got, well, Hagar, that maid. And by the way, where did he get the maid? Oh, yeah, that was back in Egypt, wasn't it? When he wasn't supposed to go down to Egypt, he went down to Egypt, picked up an Egyptian maid, and then he goes into the Egyptian maid, and the result is Ishmael, and the descendants of Ishmael are the Arabians. And so what we could say is that all the problems now are actually coming from problems in the past. I wonder how many assemblies their present problems go back quite a ways. Things done in the past that weren't done right and there's still a repercussions at 4.30 <laughs> this afternoon right here. Isn't that amazing? See, that there are always consequences to disobedience. Always. Again, we're, we're, we're thankful. God is so gracious. He forgives sin. But there are still consequences, aren't they? You don't believe me, ask David. He'll tell you. God forgives sin. Oh, the blessedness of the one whose sins are not put to his account. He, he, he'll say that with, with great joy. Psalm 32. Those transgressions are forgiven. He, he gets that. But David had to live with the consequences of his disobedience for years to come, didn't he? And so sometimes in our assemblies, we see the current problem, but sometimes the current problem actually goes back quite a ways. And we start trying to put things right. We might stir up a lot of things from the past. <laughs> But we've got to deal with it. It has to be dealt with. But if we're going to stay reproached, we stay as we are. Or are we going to move forward? And we might find some things come to light that are a little bit disturbing. And so, well, that clock tells us it is now 4.30. And we have got to come back here for a gospel meeting at 6.30, so we better finish on time. So let's just pray. Father, we're thankful for the Word of God and how practical it is, how up-to-date it is, how relevant it is. Lord, speak to our hearts. Are we part of the problem? Are we willing to acknowledge we're part of the problem and determine by the grace of God to be part of the solution? Lord, help us to be honest in your presence about our true condition and seek by thy grace to move forward. Lord, we'd like to think that somehow we might get on the enemy's radar screen, not because we want that unwarranted attention from him and his demonic forces, but we do want to be a threat to his domain. We want to, as it were, plunder, as it were, the gates of hell for the glory of Christ. So we look to thee to help us. In the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks. Amen.